Here's something cool. How about your own tornado wind turbine generating power anywhere you go? Right now, there's an early bird price of 99 euros with delivery scheduled for July 2024. Here's a little bit more about it. And check out the link that's in the description notes of this show. Tornado, foldable micro wind turbine. Has a vertical axis of rotation. Battery, generator, and two USB chargers are placed in the turbine. Savonius rotor with booster dome, top mounted. Turbine Tornado is compact and can be taken with you on a trip. Assembly and installation take only a few minutes. Tornado captures the wind's power and converts it into electricity. Built-in 12,000 milliamp hours battery is wind charged efficiently. Tornado folds up quickly and easily and charges two devices at the same time. Tornado Turbine is your reliable companion. One quarter inch standard thread allows the use of accessories and install the turbine exactly where the wind is strongest. You will always be in touch with the Tornado Turbine, a unique development of the Sova Lab team. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. You're gonna acknowledge me. Time to talk Monday Night Raw. And what a Monday Night Raw it was. Things have picked up in a big way. And I kind of had a feeling that they would. You know, you're coming off of a PLE that is still kind of attached to some of the things that went on at WrestleMania. And it wasn't an extremely an eventful Clash of the Castle. Uh, it, it was a a bit subdued when it comes to surprises and 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 booking. It wasn't exactly a mind blowing event. And after WrestleMania, you know that booking is going to be just some a lot of safe decisions because a lot of the decisions you make at WrestleMania should stick. And if you change that a month or two months or even three months after. It's kind of an admission that things aren't working. So, you know, you, you know that after WrestleMania for the first few months, you're not going to get a bunch of change. Okay, we had the women's tag titles change hands. Who cares? You know, uh, I mean, until the, they until they show us consistent respect for those belts, I don't have any. Uh, I want to, but I wouldn't call that a real change or a real shakeup. But now you have a Monday Night Raw that I think has ushered in the post WrestleMania 40 season where we can start looking to res to SummerSlam and yes by extension WrestleMania 41 in Vegas I think we can start to, to to discuss it I mean we already knew the main event is Rock versus Cody Rhodes that's been penciled in for a while which I'm not super excited about I have to say I think Rock Roman or Rock Brock or Cody Randy all three options are much more exciting uh you know, when it comes to The Rock coming back, I mean, his to me, the opponent that he should face is not Cody Rhodes, but I know they, they laid the table for that prior to his departure the night after WrestleMania 40 this year. And then when The Rock comes back, he'll be challenging for Cody's belt because that was the table they set prior to him leaving. They Remember they held each other's belts? So you know Cody's not going to drop it until bare minimum The Rock faces him, and even then I don't think The Rock will win. But let's talk, obviously, about Monday Night Raw. Uh, but before we do, I want to uh, let you guys know a couple things. Uh, first of all, this coming uh, pro Saturday morning, usually it's Saturday morning, Saturday midday, uh, we have our SmackDown review that's done by Michael Witter most weeks. And he's been with us for quite some time. And uh, he's coming up this 
week on his 200th episode, which will also be his final one here on the WWE podcast. So Michael Ritter is uh, yeah, moving on, moving up. I'm, I'm happy for him. Uh, you know, continue to support his podcast, by the way, Football Function, as we get closer and closer to training camps opening up. And then before you know it, it'll be, uh, you know, first week of September and we're talking football. Check out his podcast. Give him a, you know, a follow over at Football Function. But uh, yeah, so he uh, he will have his final show here on uh, this for this weekend. This This Smackdown will be his final one. And that means the spot's opening up. And I know there's some contenders and, uh, you know, I'd like to extend an invitation to those of you who, uh, maybe are passionate about wrestling or you're an experienced podcaster, um, and, uh, men and women, you guys know, I'm, I'm all about trying to get women on the show because I think it's a fun, uh, a fun thing to do when you don't hear a whole lot of shows that have women's, uh, perspectives on wrestling because most of the fans that watch wrestling are men, but, yeah, by all means, and, and I'd prefer those of you. Actually, no, I require that you are uh, you you have equipment, meaning like you have an external mic at the bare minimum, and uh, you know, obviously, timely is is also very important. Not you know, I've had people in the past, and you know, it's just the way it is, where you know, I'll, I'll get it to you in like you know a few days, and it's like no, 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 right? Like we have to be on a schedule here. So our timeliness is a big thing. Passionate about wrestling and just an external mic is really all I ask. If you're interested in throwing your hat into the ring here, so to speak, then send me a, uh, send me an email at uh, mailbag at wwpodcast.com. So kind of a casting call, open casting call for the SmackDown review starting next week, not this week, because this week will be Michael Ritter's final show. Also, I want to give a shout out to some new patrons simply awesome i guess you are simply awesome for joining the show thank you so much and uh sith x4 thank you for joining us on the wb podcast you can join them and get a shout out and get a discord server uh, discord server access over at patreon.com slash wwe podcast now a lot happened on monday night raw (laughs) i'm going to start with uncle howdy or the wyatt six and I know I've heard a lot of cute spellings of that. I don't know if it's meant to be six or like sick, S I C K. I've heard a lot, a lot of like clever little, uh, you know, ways to spell it. Whatever the group is called, whatever. Uh, Uncle Howdy's there. It looks like, I mean, I've heard Dexter Loomis is under the mask. Uh, Nikki Cross, it looks like she might be the girl that's there. Um, Unless she was let go. I don't know. It looked like Nikki Cross and a lot of makeup. And um, they closed Raw. The last five minutes of Raw ended with, we'll just call them the Wyatt Six for now, that debuted. And they used Bray Wyatt's last entrance music, which was a nice tribute. The door with the light. Very cool. You know, it's, it's also kind of emotional and sad as a reminder that, yeah, that's right. Bray Wyatt's not here. You know, it still is a a stark reminder that he's not here. He's not coming back, obviously. So there's that underlying emotional tone to the whole thing. But what we did get was a massacre, which is what the QR codes showed. Um, and it was a film out of it was a scene out of a horror film. It was well done when it comes to you know presentation, the fog. Everyone in production behind the scenes was apparently murdered. We have like a, you know, a quadruple homicide. <laughs> um, Chad Gable had the worst night in the history of nights when you think about it, right? He lost his match. He lost his group, his family, and then he got killed. <laughs> so uh, Chad Gable had, had one of the worst nights you could have. Um and Chad Gable apparently was targeted. If you there, there has been evidence as to why Chad Gable was targeted, because he's the only one that we saw anyway that uh, it was a wrestler that was targeted. I don't think I saw anyone else. It was just random people in production or whoever happened to be backstage was murdered on scene. Um, I know I'm being a bit uh, you know over dramatic, but I'm not really. I mean that that's the scene they painted, and um, you know each character was introduced one by one. 
with the fallen bodies in the you know the uh, in the smoke or in the dry ice rather. And then they all came out as a group and they stood there through the door and they, they had their masks on and it was very much a Bray Wyatt inspired group. And I know there's a lot of people that were expecting me to come on here and, you know, completely rip what we saw because it is, it is a bit preposterous that they're going talking about even on air. Oh my God, he, he looks like he's killed him. I mean, they've moved into strong language that we haven't heard in a long time on programming, if ever. Even, didn't uh, Pat McAfee say the the a-hole word on television? I mean, is this really PG anymore? Can we cover it under what TV PG guidelines are? Yeah, It has certainly expanded what it is. I mean, if this is TV PG, what's TV 14? Just outright pornography? Outright just mass killings. <laughs> I mean, if this is TV PG, um, th- this is uh, a much different TV PG than I have and was used to as a ch- as a kid. But anyway, so I know there's a lot of people who expect me to come on here and just rip this and how hokey it is and it's ridiculous. And in certain respects, it is. There's a part of me that looks at this and says, "All right, like this is y- you can't talk about death." in pro wrestling in terms of trying to present that you're actually going to kill a guy or a gal. You, you, you can't do that because you'll never deliver on it. And everyone knows you're never going to deliver on it. And that's not what pro wrestling is about. I mean, this isn't death match. You know, these, these are wrestling matches. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it kind of defeats the purpose or is counterintuitive to what you're trying to achieve when you're talking about killing people or you show people who look like they've been killed backstage it's a little extreme, and everyone knows it's not actually something that happened. It's, I, I don't know. I, so that part of me does exist, and it is a bit ridiculous, and it does draw back bad feelings about the pandemic era when Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn you know, went wild and had all their fanatical, you know, very performative cinematic matches that I hated for the most part. So there was some kind of PTSD for me for that. So absolutely, yeah, it was a bit ridiculous, but but – it was done well and it it got people talking and this group does look like it's going to be a babyface group for at least the time being what are they going to say what's their mission statement who are they targeting and why how does bray wyatt factor into this was the insp- he's the inspiration is you know they're going to even mention him is it uh, bo dallas who's in as the uh, as uncle howdy i would imagine yes so i think uncle howdy has to finally speak next week he can no longer hide under the guise of QR codes and masks. He needs to speak along with introducing his members, whatever names they might be, and the name of the group officially next week, I hope. But Chad Gable, uh, just to come back to him for a minute, it looked like he got shot in the head. <laughs> just, I mean, that's what it looked like. He got shot in the head. Everyone in production was murdered. So I kind of laughed at that. I did roll my eyes a bit, but poor Chad Gable, who had a hell of a night, um, and we'll get to him and Otis and his kind of turn on Gable that really isn't a full turn yet uh, in a little bit. But uh, you know, the Uncle Howdy stuff, just to kind of put a bow on that part of the, the show anyway, I, I'm not a fan of the cinematic piece of wrestling when it comes to you know, trying to pretend that somebody's actually dead when clearly they're not right i mean you don't bring death into wrestling unless it's obviously someone who passed and then you have tribute shows that's fine um but it was done effectively as i said and i i really can't ask for more than that i'm really curious to see how they explain what why they did what they did and how no one's actually dead (laughs) so um Anyway, I know I overall did I enjoy it? Kind of, yeah. Kind of because it intrigued me. It was better than um that group. You guys remember this too during the pandemic era? Not not Raw Underground. Oh my god, Raw Underground could be talked about with Shane McMahon and and uh, Omos at the time who was like the the bouncer to get into Raw Underground. And it was just like basically a little stiffer version of wrestling in this like smoky warehouse and they had women in 
uh, you know, scantily clad outfits. And it was like a, it was like Monday Night Raw from 1998. It was weird. Anyway, it reminded me of that group. And I can't remember the name of the group off the top of my head because I really just discarded it from my memory. It was damaging my brain. It was that group that came in and they started taking t- chainsaws to the ropes and they like destroyed everything and attacked fans that were there in the pandemic era. Remember that group? What the hell was that group called? I can't remember. And they would just destroy things week after week. And then what did WWE do instead of, you know, calling police? They awarded them contracts. Remember that? What the hell was the name of that group? It was the same time that Raw Underground was going on. So it was like two awful ideas going on at once. Um, what is the name? I can't think of it. Someone out there is yelling at me right now. It's uh, I can't remember it. Um, but you guys know what I'm talking about. And like in WWE, what do they do if you destroy their stuff, throw bricks through their windows, tear up the ring, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars in damage? What do they do? Here's a contract, pal. Just don't do it again. Promise. Pinky promise will give you, you know, an actual contract to be a a, a wrestler. Just to, please don't destroy any more of our stuff. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. I hated everything about it. But it, it had a tiny bit of that vibe of concern at the beginning and then I realized that Vince McMahon's no longer there so I think we'll be okay but um, all right well so I, I've said my piece on Uncle Howdy's group if it eventually is called the Wyatt Six if you sick sick uh, I mean, if you get what I'm saying six you, you guys know what, what the spelling is it's a little bit clever or if it's ended up being another name whatever it is we'll find out I think next Monday when Uncle Howdy or Bro Dallas should talk. I hope we get some kind of uh, speech from him. So also, Drew McIntyre quit. That was a bit of a disappointment for me. I understand he's at his breaking point. I also think it could be a ploy to then come back the next week when Punk is there next week, maybe, and attack Punk and say, you know, I just wanted to teach you a lesson, uh, you know, that uh, I'm not going to do what you did and quit the company when it gets hard. So he could be parodying, kind of trying to, I don't know if parodying, making a parody of punk, or if it's a setup for punk to, uh, you know, be in a vulnerable situation and then Drew attacks him. Ultimately, with the message being, you know, I'm pro- I want to prove to you that I'm nothing like you. I don't quit when things get hard. You know, so it could very well be a setup. I don't think Drew obviously is quitting. So, I, but I was disappointed they went this road because I don't want the quiet Drew McIntyre. I don't want the Drew McIntyre that's just doesn't have words. I want the Drew that's out of his mind. And we were promised that it would be must see TV for Drew, and it was anything but. Even Michael Cole was like, "What?" And I'm sitting at home like, "Okay, yeah, it's a little bit of a swerve, but I want to see Drew, uh, Drew McIntyre absolutely lose his mind." And we got the opposite. So, like, I, I understand we're we're still chapters away from the end of the story, and he could come back next week and bloody punk and all that kind of stuff. And oh, we're okay now. We get it. It just was a little di- di- guy. Sorry, guys, I can't talk tonight. It was a little bit disappointing that it we didn't get it last night on Raw with that McIntyre who was poised to blow his top. So I don't know. I just had a bit of a higher expectation. And was a bit disappointed when he just said CM Punk. And, and then he just you know, quit. And Adam Pierce is chasing him and trying to get him back to his office and saying, no, Drew, you don't want to do this. Uh, you know, So uh, that's that. We also got the return of Seth Rollins. I won't say Seth freaking Rollins. I think I, I don't like saying that. I think it sounds cheesy. Never been a fan of that. Seth Rollins, who looks good. I like his outfit. Um. I'm glad he didn't shave his beard completely because there were uh, pictures surfacing after he departed after WrestleMania 40 to go fix himself up and all that, that he shaved his beard. And I was like, oh, my God, this does not look good. But it's back. And uh, that's a good thing. And uh, we did get an interaction between Punk, I'm sorry, Rollins and Priest. And it seemed kind of mutually respectable at first with uh Seth Rollins and and, uh, Damien genuinely welcoming him back. But then Rollins told Priest that the difference between you and I is that I have a set and you don't. And it broke down a little bit, not physically, but uh, 
I guess, on a verbal level from there. Still not a lot of talk about Gunther, by the way, who is and does have a world title shot at SummerSlam. And I understand they have money in the bank here, and Gunther's in a holding pattern until that program can kick into gear. I will say, when that match between Rollins and Priest was made, which was Priest's idea, by the way, we, I think, pretty much locked it up that Punk, I keep saying Punk, Rollins is going to win that match because when you think about it, are you really going to have a Priest and Gunther matchup at SummerSlam? Does that really interest you? Here's something cool. How about your own tornado wind turbine generating power anywhere you go? Right now, there's an early bird price of 99 euros with delivery scheduled for July 2024. Here's a little bit more about it. And check out the link that's in the description notes of this show. Tornado, foldable micro wind turbine. has a vertical axis of rotation. Battery, generator, and two USB chargers are placed in the turbine. Savonius rotor with booster dome, top mounted. Turbine Tornado is compact and can be taken with you on a trip. Assembly and installation take only a few minutes. Tornado captures the wind's power and converts it into electricity. Built-in 12,000 milliamp hours battery is wind charged efficiently. Tornado folds up quickly and easily and charges two devices at the same time. Tornado Turbine is your reliable companion. One quarter inch standard thread allows the use of accessories and install the turbine exactly where the wind is strongest. You will always be in touch with the Tornado Turbine, a unique development of the Sova Lab team. No, I think Rollins and Gunther interests us a lot more. So I don't know where that leaves Priest. It could be with somebody in the Judgment Day who turns on him, screws him, helps accidentally, maybe purposefully screws him at Money in the Bank. So Seth will not be in the Money in the Bank briefcase match, but is going to face Damian Priest. And I think Seth Rollins is already a heavy favorite to beat Damian Priest. Because like I said, when you look ahead to SummerSlam with Gunther waiting in the wings, it's just you can't tell me that there's a lot of interest in Priest versus Gunther. I mean, it wouldn't. I wouldn't go crazy over it. I wouldn't call it the worst thing in the world. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, people want Rollins and Gunther, and I think we're going to get it at SummerSlam with Rollins as the world champion, which as you project out even further, I don't think Gunther would win that because Seth would have just won it at the PLE before. And then at that point, McIntyre and Punk might be starting to conclude their program or be closer to it. And once Drew and Punk conclude their program after SummerSlam, then you have Rollins and Punk who have yet to get back to their program. And when Punk goes back to Rollins, Rollins is still world champion. You have a Punk versus Rollins world championship matchup that could take place as soon as, uh, you know, Crown Jewel. They love that. I think that's in October or November. And uh, maybe they wait all the way to SummerSlam or rather uh, Survivor Series or even probably beyond because Survivor Series is all about war games. Uh, they you know, like, might, might wait until Rumble or they might wait until WrestleMania before Punk and Rollins cross paths again. But it does seem like Rollins, if he when he likely wins it from Priest at the uh, Money in the Bank PLE, that Rollins is going to hold it a while until Punk is ready to get into come into the fold. So just my projection out for several months there with the world title picture, it seems kind of that's the way they're going. So I, those of you that are enjoying Priest as world champion, and I'm one of them, I really have enjoyed his run. Surprisingly, really enjoyed it. I wouldn't mind if it kept going, but knowing WWE, and it's a business, they have to put on the biggest matches or they should be trying to 
Priest probably should drop it, even though he's been a really fun champion more than I expected. Uh, but anyway, I know there's a lot that could happen between now and SummerSlam, but uh, just wanted to give you my thoughts on the, as like I said, the world title picture. All right, so what else is uh, or did happen on Monday Night Raw? Again, we got Money in the Bank qualifiers that started, and we'll get to that. I'm just reading a uh, rundown of Raw to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything big here. Uh, we got so Chad Gable coming out, and it ended up being Chad Gable versus Braun Strowman, and... Chad Gable got beat pretty handily in six and a half minutes. I wasn't a fan of that because, look, I know Braun Strowman is a big guy. He's a one big SOB. He's strong, much stronger, much heavier than Gable. But Gable's been on the rise for quite some time, nearly beat Gunther, for God's sakes, several times, and then he gets pretty much handily beaten by Strowman. I, I wasn't a big fan of that. Also, since when did Braun Strowman become our moral overlord? He's all about making sure bullies don't bully. Yet he's in a match with Chad Gable in which he's, you know, Chad Gable is sorely, severely oversized. Uh, he continues to pick fights, pick fights with the Judgment Day. He's the one that has started that. I don't know what his beef is with the Judgment Day. But that's all Braun Strowman has seemingly done is pick on the Judgment Day and pick on the Judgment Day and pick on the Judgment Day and attack the Judgment Day unprovoked. And yet Braun Strowman is the one who's the defender of the innocent and the defender of people being bullied. Is he the one to really say that? Not exactly in a position to to uh, stand on some kind of moral high ground. But I don't know, maybe it's just my non-fan of, not, I'm not really a fan of Braun Strowman, if you can't really tell. Again, <clears throat> I uh, respect his in-ring work, because I, I continue to say this. I don't want to, I really don't want to disrespect his work for wh- the size he is. He is very good in the ring for what he should be able to do. And I give him credit for that. And he's trimmed down, and he has, he's a safe worker generally, and, and all that. I'm just not a fan of his character. I think it's extremely one-dimensional. He, he, you know, he's, he's just always roaring. He's, you know, always yelling. He runs around the ring, and we're supposed to believe that somehow he gets more speed by, you know, running in a square-shaped pattern. Figure that out, by the way. <laughs> you, you, you don't gain more momentum by running in a pattern shaped like a square. You know the way that you get the most momentum? You run in a straight line. But we're supposed to believe that he picks up more momentum the the longer he's running around the ring. So, I don't know. I I just, I'm not ever advocating for Braun Strowman to be released. I think he is an asset to the company. He is. He is is an asset to the company. But I just, uh, I'm just not a fan of his character. That's, it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And I think there's some major flaws in his character, and I think he's genuinely unlikable. But that's all uh, my opinions, of course. So Braun Strowman beats Gable, and then, you know, after the match, something's going to happen here because Gable lost again. He ordered his minions or pledges or pupils or whatever you want to label them as into the ring, and Gable shoved Tozawa and uh, Dupree was, Maxine came in between both of them, and Gable took Dupree's crutch, threw it to ringside, and forced her to leave without her crutch, which is really funny. I mean, it just he's just such a perfect jerk. Otis then helped Maxine out of the ring, and then Gable slapped Tazawa, like, like flat out. Um, and then Otis turned around and looked at Tazawa, and Otis shoved Gable to the mat, ripped off his T-shirt, the crowd popped really big for this, and Gable is begging for mercy in the corner. But Otis left, and the fans were chanting for Otis, and he helped Dupree and uh, Tazawa to the back, and that that was it. So uh, I don't think that um, we have a real turn yet from Otis, and I know there's some 
belief that Gable could be joining forces soon with Julius Creed, Brutus Creed, the Creed brothers, and Ivy Nile, I think that's a very good decision. Because Gable could say that he's found some real new students, that he's got a real family that obeys him and respects him. I mean, it's not over by a long shot. But I would have liked Otis, if, if this was determined to be the turn, quote unquote, the, the, you know, this is where Otis finally snapped. If this is re- really, if that's it, then I, this is a big disappointment. I know they're going to have tag team matches and several variations of matches moving on. But if this was the moment, because they're all about moments, if this was to be the moment that Otis finally snapped on Gable, it left a lot to be desired. And again, it's not to say that they can't have a lot of matches down the road with tag teams and six women and, and, and having Maxine and uh, Ivy Nile face off and all that. You could do many combinations with the Creed brothers and with Akira Tozawa and with Otis and, and Gable. Of course you can. But again, that moment, that moment that happened last night was the moment that they've been building to, that you've been wanting to see, that the crowd's been asking to see and chanting for. And you can't get that moment back. You would have liked to have seen if this was really the moment, and I think it was because it's hard to duplicate this again, then it's a bit of a womp because it could have been better. Otis should have laid the smack down all over Gable, and then that's when Gable goes and recruits some new pupils and gets his revenge on Otis next week. But you at least in the moment have that moment. So I don't know. Um you know, Gable deserved to get his ass beat there. And then he comes back and gets his heat back the very next week. But again, the, uh, at this point, the way he left Monday Night Raw with Gable being just weirdly sidetracked into the Wyatt Six you know, assault, it looks like Gable should be, you know, uh, we should be having a, a, a wake for him next week. He looked like he got shot in the head. So a weird turn of events for Gable. All right. A lot of recap from not just Clash of the Castle, but also the Liv and Dom stuff. And Liv stole Dom's vest, and then she asked Dom if you want it back to, uh, you'll have to take it off me. And Liv's playing her role just so, just perfectly. I will say Dom, when he, you know, was uh, trying to search for his vest, does he not watch his own the show? I mean, his the show that you're on would have revealed to you who has it and where they are. Yeah, but so it's kind of a weirdly timed thing when he saw Liv and he's like, oh, I was like, you're the one that has my vest. It's like, dude, if you just watched the show five minutes earlier, you would have seen, you know, but fine. I, I still love this storyline. Dom is eventually going to cave here if he already hasn't. I think that this is done. This whole thing has been very well um very well executed by Dom, especially by Liv, who is the breakout star here, who has seemingly finally found her footing as to who and what she is. This version of, of Liv Morgan is the is the sweet spot. You know, she's undershot it, overshot it. Now she's kind of, I think, where she needs to be character-wise. It's the right amount of seduction uh, for what her character is doing. And by the way... Her character is only doing this to get at Rhea Ripley. This is not doing a uh, seductive character for the sake of seduction. There's a evil intent behind it. So those of you that are saying, well, I thought you wanted women to progress and move. Yeah, I do. But there's a way to do sensuality and seduction that isn't overtly sexual, right? There's a way to do it. And they're, they're threading that needle perfectly here. You know, Liv isn't coming out in stripper clothes, and wearing potato sacks. She, th- th- there is a way to be sensual with your look, with your voice, with your eyes that don't always require the superficial version of sensuality that we look at today and think about today, which is just how much skin is she showing? How much ass is she showing? Are her boobs out? You know? So this is a very, I think, deeper sensuality that she is... Uh, She's showing, and I, I really appreciate that. 
you know, because it's a, it, it tells a better story with Dom and Liv than the superficial version of what, you know, a lot of us think about sexuality and sensuality today. So a uh, little nuance there, but I, I love this story. You know, the key card from last week, Finn is claiming he kept it to protect Dom and then Damien catches Dom unzipping Liv to get his vest back. It's all just, again, very well done. Uh, it's, it's purple cow vest, by the way. <laughs> oh, God, it's great. So, okay, we get uh, EO Sky versus Kiana James versus Zelina Vega in a triple threat qualifying match. I guess they're going a lot of triple threats for the Money in the Bank ladder match, which is fine. For the uh, women's Money in the Bank ladder match, and uh, let's see. There are going to be six entrants, by the way, into the Money in the Bank ladder matches. And we ended up getting EO Sky winning after she defeated Kiana uh, James and Zelina Vega in eight and a half minutes. And it was because of uh, Liv Morgan, who walked out and distracted Vega, and James knocked Vega to ringside, and then Sky hit James with a Meteora and then hit her with the over the moon salt and scored the victory. So good. I mean, it was a fine triple threat. Not much more to say there. Now, Let's see. We got uh, our screaming Intercontinental Champion, Sami Zayn, coming out and said he was proud to walk into Corpus Christi, still the IC champ, and said that Gable didn't make that easy. And in so many words, said he's moving on from Chad Gable. And uh, Braun Breaker came out, which, by the way, can this dude get, please get some new entrance music? He needs it desperately. Braun Breaker, for all the impact he's had, needs entrance music in the worst way. It's not catchy. It's not an. It's not annoying. It's not anything. It's just, just there. It's like the background music to a video game. It's not. It's not nothing. And so they need to really be. Hopefully, if they're positioning Breaker for a long, sustained run as a top guy in the near future. They need to revamp his entrance, not his character necessarily. I think his character is slowly, you know, you're seeing slow layers being built to him, but entrances are important. And I think that uh, it's time for us to get a revamped version of his entrance music. Something that is, again, it doesn't have to be catchy. I know we're all looking for the catchy tune, the sing along tune, which is, Really, what wrestling uh, you know baby faces have going for them these days? Seth Rollins, Sami Zayn, most notably Cody Rhodes, uh, even Randy Orton. So it's not about sing along for me. It's just catchy, um, impactful. It's just like someone took El Generico and sh- gave him his uh, you know his entrance music. So anyway, Braun Breaker came out and uh, said he didn't have much to say. Because Zane knows what he's there for and what he's capable of doing. And Zane spoke about the bodies he's left. And Breaker said Zane is next on his list because I'm taking the Intercontinental Championship. And Sheamus comes out and makes his entrance. Um, he said he's been chasing the IC title for five years. I didn't know he never won it. That's crazy. Sheamus said that if Zayn is giving out opportunities, he should consider him. Sheamus told Zayn he's coming for the title. And this led to a match between the two after some more uh, trash talk. And uh, that would happen later in the night to see who would face Sami Zayn for the Intercontinental title. All right. Well, then we get Dragon Lee versus Carlito, which ended with Carlito beating Dragon Lee in eight minutes. But again, Liv Morgan came out in the purple cow vest. And uh, Zelina Vega came out, shoved Morgan into Dom, and Wild tried to pull Vega away and then got into it with Dom, who shoved him into the ring steps, and Ray threw punches at Dom. And then Lee went to the ropes and was tripped by McDonough. Carlito hits a backstabber on Lee and then got the victory. And, uh, yeah. So, fine. Fine finish here. All right. McIntyre comes out, as I said. And just said, I can't do this anymore. Screw this company. I quit. And 
so yeah, again, a very to me a missed opportunity in this particular description. You know, this this uh, you know the, the reviewer was looking for a pipe bomb version of a promo for McIntyre, and I, I would I would concur with that. There was so much anger and frustration he could have tapped into here, and it was just oh, I I quit. It's like really, oh, I mean, there's there's times to say that and do that. I'm not against someone saying I quit as part of a story. This was not one of those times, though. Like, there's, you could have gotten more out of this moment, and Drew's more than capable of doing it. So, again, I just, I don't agree with how this was done, but I'm still absolutely intrigued by when McIntyre returns. I mean, obviously, it's a ruse. He didn't actually quit. He's going to attack Punk and then use this against Punk and all these things, and that's fine. But boy, you had a perfect setup, and it was even advertised as such that it's must see TV tomorrow night. Can you imagine what Drew's going to do? And Drew's like, Yeah, I'm out. It's like, What are you talking about? You're out. What do you mean you're out? <laughs> it's just a, I'm just disappointing from my perspective. All right, Dakota Kai and Kyrie Sane versus Caden Carter and Katana Chance. And this match. As every single Monday Night Raw, any tag team champion or any tag team match with the women that doesn't have anything to do with anything lasts two and a half minutes. That seems to be exactly the case this week, too. It's just two and a half minutes with Caden Carter and Katana Chance beating Dakota Kai and Kyrie Sane. Fine. I mean, I hate to say it, but whatever. <laughs> because th- there wasn't a whole lot of urgency with this match. It felt very much like a filler, very much like a check box, a check mark in the box that they had a women's tag team match. Um, Yeah, so. All right, we get Braun Breaker versus Sheamus. And I really enjoyed this. You know, Sheamus has gotten himself back into a leaner, meaner version of himself. Um, There's no longer burger after burger after burger as... <laughs> As McIntyre famously put it several weeks ago, um, physical match, fun match. The the announcers putting over Breaker constantly is is actually, I mean, I understand why they're doing it. I mean, talking about how fast he runs the ropes and how explosive he is. And I mean, I, I have no problem with that. You know, that's their job is to put over talent. And giving us those stats is very interesting, you know. Uh, but Sheamus uh, ended up, well, not winning, but it was a no contest in about 13 minutes, this match went into a no contest because we got uh, Ludwig Kaiser showing up and pull a sh- pulled Sheamus out after he was just about to go for the bro kick. And then, you know, Kaiser ended up slamming Sheamus' bad knee into the ring post and the referee called for the bell. And uh, Sheamus got the better of Kaiser. And that's when Breaker ended up spearing Sheamus. He ended up eventually also spearing Kaiser. So, Breaker had another spear-filled night. So, yeah, it's also it, was, it, was, it made sense that honestly we didn't get a clean finish here. Sheamus just returned. You can still get some mileage out of him. And Breaker is a guy that does not need or should have a loss on his record right now. So Braun Breaker has been billed as the guy that is destructive. He's not Goldberg for everyone else, by the way, mentioning it. He's not Goldberg. Goldberg had as many, um, you know, moves in his arsenal as I have hairs on my head. Okay. And if you see the logo of my show, I think that should answer your questions about how many moves Goldberg had. Um, But the, the spear, I will say too, the spear is becoming the super kick. In some respects, where it seems like we have everyone using it now, I would cool it with the spear. Braun Breaker should be the only guy using it. I know Jey Uso does. Uh, he's a big star, obviously. One of the faces of Monday Night Raw. And now we have Braun Breaker using it. There's someone else that uses it, too. Obviously, Roman Reigns uses it as a finish. And it's an impactful big move, but it feels like slowly people are adopting it here. But... All right, so well, we did get a, a promo, by the way, from Karrion Cross and Scarlett. Cross spoke about his recent dealings with Kofi and Xavier, and Cross said he was thinking about doing something really out of control, but then Scarlett came up with an idea to do something that wouldn't result in him going to jail, and Cross challenged Kingston or Woods to face him in a match, 
with no one at ringside, and uh, Cross said he hopes it would be Kingston and added that he, Kofi would rather have Woods in the back anyway. So, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I guess they're trying to talk about a potential split with these with the New Day. Honestly, I don't even care anymore. I just want them off my screen. I, mean, I don't know how to say it any more than that. All right. Cole also announced that Drew deactivated all of his social media accounts after announcing he quit. So they're trying to make this a little real, I guess. But ultimately, Drew is, of course, going to come back and attack Punk. I appreciate the commitment, though. Jay versus Ray versus Finn. This was a Money in the Bank qualifier for the men's side of things. So again, we have EO as one of the competitors of the women. Uh, the men was about to be decided here as far as who's going to be the first competitor in the match. And it ended up being Jey Uso, who wins in about 16 minutes. And really fun match for all three of these men. Um, six one nines everywhere. And, uh, you know, 619, you get a 619, and you get a 619. It was all over the place. Uh, you know, we did get Dom showing up, and, it, it, you know, I don't know. It, it felt a very Judgment Day-ish kind of finish here. But Jay getting the victory was the right move. Jay was the first one to talk about Money in the Bank several weeks ago before he even clashed at the castle. Jay, I think, right now is a heavy favorite to win the Money in the Bank. As he should be, because think about this. As you move forward, if my plan does come to fruition, where Seth wins against Priest, becomes world champion at Money in the Bank, and I think he will, you then have um, you have Jey Uso looming, but again, you have a year to cash it in. And you have Seth Rollins, who is world champion, likely if he wins at um, at Money in the Bank, he's probably going to keep that for at least through Survivor Series to the Rumble, maybe to WrestleMania. And then you can have Jey Uso maybe cash in on the heel that ends up beating Seth Rollins. Maybe it's Gunther. Maybe Jey Uso eventually cashes in on Gunther. I don't know. A lot of scenarios. I know I spiderwebbed into possibilities here and you never know what's going to happen I and mean, we don't even know the other five competitors yet jay is just one so all right so we have again aggravated assault occur after this i mean it was a uh, a fun visual but you can't think too hard at all about this if you want to enjoy it i just hope they don't go on this tirade of actually trying to kill people or that they, you know, they they make everyone bleed all the time. I appreciate the resurgence of blood, though. I have to say, I'm a big blood fan when it when necessary. But um, I, I just hope they don't go and try to actually kill people every week. That that's it. Be, it'll become laughable. You know, you can get away with it once, and next week you can say that you know several staff members were hospitalized including Chad Gable. Everyone's in stable condition. Uh, everyone's expected to make it some broken bones, right? Like you can make it like everyone, you know, the, everyone that was shown was knocked out, not killed, but there were blood splatters, <laughs> not just on Chad Gable, but like uh, on several like areas of the backstage area where gorilla is, there were several blood spatters. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know how they're going to explain it, but I'd be cool if they just said, you know, that, no one's in critical condition that, you know, everyone's hospitalized, you know, make up something, but I don't want their gig to be that they kill people. Please don't let it be their gig, please. I think that would be, it would just, it's just not, it's not real. Like I said, you can't deliver. You can't deliver on it. So just a, just a thought there, but all right, I know, as I said, I know I don't, every week I don't cover every nook and cranny of Raw. I just don't. That's not my style. But I think I hit on a lot of the big stuff. And it was a very eventful Raw. If you were in Raw, at Raw in Corpus Christi, Texas, at the American Bank Center, you had a hell of a show. I think you got your money's worth. Between debuts of the Wyatt Six family, whatever they're called, uh, Seth Rollins returning, Money in the Bank qualifiers, Drew quitting. You got a lot here. 
So I think it was a fun show, and it's only going to get better from here as we get closer and closer to Money in the Bank. We get to think about who could win and why, and maybe some from SmackDown wins and all, all that stuff. So we've got a lot to talk about as we move forward here in in time, and uh, then we start talking about SummerSlam after this. It's going to come quick, and I think SummerSlam's super early this year too. It's the beginning of August. So you're going to blink, and summer's going to be over. Honestly, when SummerSlam comes, you know it's the end of the summer because SummerSlam, it's August always, and you're like, well, there goes summer. It's over. June to me flies by. It's the fastest month of the whole year for me, June, for some reason. And we're already nearly 20 days into June. We're two-thirds of the way through June already. And I, we just got here, damn it. And July is, you know, midsummer. It's the only month you can look at and go, all right, this is truly summer. And then August, by the time August hits, especially if you're in the northern part of the United States or anywhere that has, a, you know, uh, a winter season, you're thinking to yourself, oh, okay, well, August is kind of it. Here come the leaves. Here comes pumpkin spice. Here comes football. Here comes, you know, apple picking. Here comes pumpkins. And it's over. So not to be depressing. If you love the fall weather, you know, you blink and it's here. It's the way life goes. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. And if you want to go ad-free, patreon.com slash WWE podcast is the place to go. Uh, you get access to a Discord server. You get uh, access to everything ad-free and our exclu- exclusive After Dark show done by Anthony DeMarco that is dropped every single week. For those of you on the SmackDown tier and higher, you get it every week. And you can also check out Apple Podcasts and click subscribe if you want to just use your native podcast app and go ad free that way. Excuse me, that way. Yeah, time for me to go. (laughs) I can't even talk. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'll be back. What the heck is it? Tuesday? Maybe Friday for the mailbag. So uh, you got some time to get in your questions and your voicemails. And uh, until then, take care. I'll see you next time. Here's something cool. How about your own tornado wind turbine generating power anywhere you go? Right now, there's an early bird price of 99 euros with delivery scheduled for July 2024. Here's a little bit more about it. And check out the link that's in the description notes of this show. Tornado, foldable micro wind turbine. Has a vertical axis of rotation. Battery, generator, and two USB chargers are placed in the turbine. Savonius rotor with booster dome, top mounted. Turbine Tornado is compact and can be taken with you on a trip. Assembly and installation take only a few minutes. Tornado captures the wind's power and converts it into electricity. Built-in 12,000 milliamp hours battery is wind charged efficiently. Tornado folds up quickly and easily and charges two devices at the same time. Tornado Turbine is your reliable companion. One quarter inch standard thread allows the use of accessories and install the turbine exactly where the wind is strongest. You will always be in touch with the Tornado Turbine, a unique development of the Sova Lab team. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show. Or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.